namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa viveka nisitam viraga nisitam nirodha nisitam vosadga parina So this week, uh, a very pleasant task falls to me to speak about the seven enlightenment factors. We've been going through each couple of weeks doing a different one of the, the, the many groups of dhammas, groups of uh, usually like mental factors which the Buddha <coughs> encouraged and recommended as, as uh, ways of articulating the path to enlightenment. And so the most common grouping of all these things, of course, is the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, the wings to awakening. And uh, this is the second last of the groups of Dhammas, in the 37 wings to awakening, and that is the seven enlightenment factors, bodhanga. They're called enlightenment factors because, or awakening factors, because they lead to awakening. And uh, I try these days, I try to use the word awakening rather than enlightenment. Actually, the word bodhi is much more literally means to wake up. It's actually used in that sense in the Indic languages. So to, to wake up is, is, is that's a word from the same root. The actual the translation enlightenment uh, it has an interesting history, but it actually ultimately stems from the 19th century European Indologists who were quite consciously trying to make a connection between what they conceived as the Buddha's teaching and what uh, is known in European history as the Enlightenment, yeah, the great period of... Uh, 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 it's kind of the new knowledge and so on. And so they were trying to make that correlation. That's why they used the word enlightenment, although it's not actually that closely related to the word bodhi. So wake up. That's what we're here for. We're here to wake up. We're here to make conscious those things that are unconscious. We're here to shine a light in those dark places. We're here to dispel those clouds of ignorance and delusion. And the means to do this is through seven enlightenment or awakening factors. Mindfulness, investigation of dhammas, energy, rapture, tranquility, samadhi, and equanimity. Seven mental factors to be developed, the Buddha said, bhavetabha. Yeah. As usual in these kinds of groups of dhammas, there's a certain sense in which we can think of them as being progressive. That is, that they start with those more simple qualities and then lead up to the more exalted qualities. Yeah? A certain sense in which we can think of it that way, but not in an absolute sense. Okay, So it's not like they're kind of uh, compartmentalized and divided off from one from the other. But in a certain way, we can, we can start out with the slightly more... Usually, when we, when, we, when we look at these lists, when we analyze them, see the structure, we can see that they start out with the more basic or preliminary factors and then move up to more exalted things as time goes on. There's a sense of a progression there. Now this one starts out with mindfulness. You might be a bit disappointed to learn that mindfulness is meant to be a preliminary practice. Maybe you've been trying to actually do mindfulness and you think, well, this is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And this is just the kindergarten stuff. How depressing is that? Yeah. So... Yes, in a sense, mindfulness is a preliminary practice, but also 
is a very advanced practice to, to perfect mindfulness. Now that's something different. That's not preliminary. That's the, that's the state of mind of an arahant, yeah? One who's fully awakened. They've perfected mindfulness. They're mindful all the time. So it's like this. It's mindfulness is the thing which we have to start, we have to kind of try to rouse up to get our practice going, to get it established in the first place. And then at each stage of the practice, as we keep on going, everything, every little part of the practice involves mindfulness in its own way. Yeah? As you're sitting here right now, are you being mindful? Maybe, you, I remember in the 70s they had that comedy program, Are You Being Served? Do you remember that? So maybe you could do Are You Being Mindful instead? You know, Tales from a Meditation Center. It could be quite good. Or from a monastery, maybe. We, 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 sometimes we talk about that in the monastery. We can do like a big bante instead of having big brother. You can put like webcams, <laughs> webcams in all the kutis and see when the monks are meditating and stuff. <laughs> are you sitting there being aware of what's going on? Are you aware of your posture right now? Are you conscious of what's going on? Are you sitting there thinking, planning tomorrow's shopping list? Are you sitting there thinking, worrying about what the kids have done to the house while you're away? Are you being mindful right now? If you can't be mindful right now, what's the point? Yeah? What's the point in trying to practice? We're here now. Here we've come together. We've all made this effort to come to this Dhamma talk. Can we be mindful? Just for this moment. Forget about being mindful through the whole day. Right? Can we be mindful right now, just as we're sitting here? Just one moment of mindfulness through the day. That's pretty good already. That's more than most of us can manage most of the time. Yeah? Just one moment, a few, maybe a few seconds, even a few minutes maybe, just to be able to be in the body, conscious of how we feel, conscious of what we're doing here in the present moment, right here and now. When we can do this, we're doing that awakening factor of mindfulness. Now, the Buddha talked about mindfulness like at every stage of the path. Mindfulness at one level, we're sitting here, aware, awake, what's going on during this Dhamma talk, and so that we can remember it afterwards. When our mind's clear and clean, then the words will sink in and we'll be able to remember that, to recall that. It's a good thing to test yourself with. Yeah, When you've left the Dharma talk and you go home and you think, right, what was that Dharma talk about? Oh, it was a great Dharma talk. What was it about? Oh, uh, my, uh, mindfulness and stuff. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, you know, like, you know, think like people who's really good in mindfulness, like Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's favorite disciple, and he, had, he was regarded as the foremost in mindfulness, and he could remember all of the talks, right, even from like 20 years beforehand. He'd only heard it once, and he could remember it 20 years later. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah? But it's there. That's what you have to, have to realize. This is not a gift which some people have and some people don't have. Right? The mind is the same. The Buddha's mind, Ananda's mind, whoever's mind it is, it's basically the same. And that information is there. Once you've heard that, it's there. It's in your consciousness forever. As long as your mind remains, it's possible for you to access that. The only thing is, is your mindfulness sharp enough to be able to actually discern it and bring it to the surface? We don't lose information, we don't forget. But all we do is that the, the echoes of it become dimmer and it becomes harder for us to access it. But if we can sharpen our mind through practicing meditation, then the more and more we'll be, we'll be able to remember. So this is something that's very good. It's very good to practice with re remembering things. It's not something which, which we are... Uh, 
um, trained to do in modern education. In, in old days education, of course, you had what we call rote learning, where you just had to sit down and learn all the names of all the rivers in Australia or something like that. And this is what education was. And so these days we don't tend to do that so much. And that's, you know, it's probably a good thing. But the downside of that is that our memories are not trained so well. And this is something I really noticed because I, was, I used to be a musician. And so as a musician, of course, you get used to learning songs and learning pieces of music and practicing this for many years. And, you know, by the time, uh, you know, I've been... Well, by the time I'd gone to Thailand and you know been playing music for many years, you know I could listen to a song two or three times and remember it, you know, and know you know what it was and so on, and then that was enough, and you could actually remember it and play it and sing it. And so when I went to Thailand, and you know we could learn, started to learn the chanting and learn the Pali and all of these kinds of things, I found it very easy. And other monks would be really struggling, but I found it quite simple to to remember these things, not because of any innate capacity, but just because I, I trained myself as a musician to actually learn how to remember things. Yeah? So it's not something which we either have or we don't have, it's something which we can train. And it's very important with the Dharma because when you need it, you know, there's not necessarily going to be a teacher around, there's not going to be a book around. Yeah? When you need that help at that time, you don't know. You're going to have to come back to yourself and you're going to have, you're going to, have to use the Dhamma at that time. And it's very hard. Like you might be sitting here now and it might be very obvious to you. You might think, oh, well, of course, I knew that. I know mindfulness. I know these things. But what happens, you know, when you're in a car crash? At that moment, what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, excuse me, I'll just pick up my Maji Manikaya and see what that says about, you know, Oh, excuse me, I'll just get on my cell phone and, and ring the Ajahn and ask his advice how to cope with this situation. How strong is your mindfulness? Yeah? I was in, when I was in Perth many years ago, <coughs> we were talking with one of the Thai women there who had been practicing meditation for many years. And she, you know, she came in that day and she said, early, I think earlier that day or a day or two earlier, she had been in a very, very bad car crash and she was sitting in the back seat of a car and they were coming towards an intersection quite fast I can't remember the details now, but there was two or three cars involved and a very, very bad crash. And she said as soon as she saw it happening and she saw this other car coming, she knew a crash was inevitable. Her mind went straight into samadhi. She just went straight into the buddho, which she'd been recollecting, and just went, went inside. And she was completely oblivious for the whole crash. She was just, just gone inside and was perfectly okay at the end of it. And then everything happened and then she just sort of came out. Yeah? So that's what that practice of mindfulness is. Is that Dhamma going to help you at that moment when you need it? Is it going to come to you like that? Yeah? This is the test. Yeah? So, listening to the talks, keeping your sila, keeping your precepts, also mindfulness is the one who's going to help you keeping your precepts. Yeah? You're aware Often, often people say, well, you know, I can't keep my precepts because of this reason or that reason or this situation or that situation or something. But if you have your mindfulness, you know how your mind's going to re respond or react in a certain situation. What's going to pull you? What's going to tempt you? What's going to help you to keep your sense of composure about that? And so I'll say here again, my, my, one of my favorite stories about this, many of you may have heard this before, but this is from a friend of mine in, in Malaysia and he was uh, doing a deal, business deal in Thailand. He went to Bangkok. And to kind of cement the deal, they went out to a nightclub in the evening. And they went out and uh, all, of the, all of the Thai businessmen were there and he was there and they, sit, and they all kind of sit around the table and, they came, and everyone has to have a drink. So it's like everyone, you know, here's your, here's your whiskey or whatever it was. And my friend said, oh, you know, that's, that's very kind of you, but I don't drink, I'm, you know, keep the five precepts. And then they all had a, a, a girl, okay, so they all had a, a, a prostitute for each one of the businessmen. And apparently this is standard business practice. I don't know, I've never moved in those circles. <laughs> so I, I just take this on trust that this is how deals are cemented. And I said, I asked him, what happens if the, you know, one of the business people is a woman? What do they do? And they said, well, they get a gigolo for her, you know? 
and this is how they do the deals. And uh, and he said, oh, you know, thank you, that's, that's very kind of you, but there's no need, you know, I'm, I'm married and, and stuff. And, and they just said to him, no, 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 you don't understand, you know, we have a drink, you have a drink, we have a girl, you have a girl, no drink, no girl, no contract. No drink, no girl, no contract. So that contract was worth $7 million. Right? He was effectively being offered $7 million to get drunk and have sex. Right? Which some people might think was a fairly good deal, right? <laughs> Most people wouldn't take a lot of persuading, you know, they kind of... And he just said, thank you very much, gentlemen, and walked out, went back to his hotel. Had a good night's sleep. What would you have done? Eva would have done the same. Yeah. In the morning, there's a knock on the hotel door. He opens it, and it's a businessman were there, and they said, okay, here's the contract, sign it. Yeah. So he had the contract anyway. But very interesting, the psychology of it, yeah? because you know, what they want to do is because they want to create like a tribal mentality. You, know, you go through this, it's almost like an initiation where you know each one is as corrupt as the other. Yeah? No one can blackmail anybody because you already know that you're all completely corrupt and, and it's a mutual understanding. So you've been there together and so he wasn't part of that. Yeah? So he was excluded. You know, but then when he, when he left, then obviously they kind of reflected about it. You, know, you reflect on it and you think, well, this person is obviously completely incorruptible. No matter what we do, he is never going to cheat us. Yeah? He is always going to keep his word and he's, he's going to be the perfect business partner. You know? So this is why, they, after they're thinking about it, they realize actually this is the perfect person to do business with. Yeah? And so this is how that strength in keeping your precepts. So this is that time when, when you're challenged with these things, that, that, that there's so many voices persuading you that are sounding very reasonable. So many voices trying to justify trying to make excuses. And they all sound perfectly reasonable when that's, when that's going on. So this is where you need your mindfulness to recognize these things for what they are. Just let go of them. Remember what's important in your life. See, that's what you can't remember in those kinds of situations. Is what actually really matters to me. Does this, the, the contract really matter to me? Well, actually, no, not really. You know, my, my wife really matters to me. <coughs> That, that's actually really important in my life. And I don't want to compromise that. Yeah, but we forget, we throw these things out that are really important for the sake of something that's very trivial. So this is mindfulness in keeping your precepts. And of course, mindfulness in meditation, watching your meditation object, breath, yeah, holding your breath like we were doing earlier, with mindfulness, remembering that breath, bringing it to mind. It's also applying there. It's also applying, like even if, you know, purified, say it's a purified and very clarified mindfulness happen if you go into a meditation attainment, like into a jhana or something like this. That's when you get very, very powerful mindfulness, okay? Then afterwards, you've got like this supercharged mindfulness, which is not like what we think of now as ordinary level mindfulness. It's like at another, it's in another level, another dimension. And when mindfulness is very strong like that, you know, you'll notice even that slightest flicker of the mind, the slightest flicker when the mind goes to what's unwholesome or what's unskillful. You can notice that. It's that slight little tendency when it's going to move off. And you can also use that mindfulness for doing things that are normally quite unthinkable, like, say, remembering your past lives. You can sort of send your mind back. And what I was saying before about you, you actually you never lose any memories. So after your mind is really charged with a deep meditation experience, you can actually send it back and remember those things that you, you never would have remembered before, even in past lives. And we can all experience these things uh, in, in, a, in a lesser way. If you've done meditation, you'll often find, especially on a meditation retreat, that after one or two days on the retreat, that you'll start to remember things from much earlier in your life that you normally don't 
don't remember. So maybe things from your childhood or something like that, and they spontaneously start to come up. So when we see that, we understand how it's possible to remember your past lives. It's the same thing, but it's happening at an even more profound level. And so this also is mindfulness. So mindfulness is going all of these ways, from very simple things that we're all doing here and now, all the way up to very profound and exalted dhammas. It's mindfulness. And all of this is within that enlightenment factor of mindfulness, or awakening factor of mindfulness. is the first of the seven awakening factors. And the Buddha, in this context, actually describes it uh, specifically in two ways. One way is mindfulness as remembering what you've heard, remembering the teachings. Okay, that's one aspect of mindfulness. The other aspect is moment-to-moment -moment awareness okay, of what's going on in your own mind. Okay, there's two aspects. Now the second of the, the enlightenment factor, awakening factors is Dhamma Vichaya, is investigation of Dhammas. And of course this being something which is very characteristic of Buddhism. You know, we don't so often encounter this in uh, other religions being emphasized so much. I mean, I don't want to make these very kind of exclusivist claims and saying only Buddhism is a teaching of in inquiry. This is not true. But it is true that Buddhism places these uh, principles of inquiry and investigation in much more central and important role than we're used to finding in religions. And so here, Dhamma Vichaya. Now, Again, this Dhamma Vichaya operates on two main dimensions, or it's described in two main ways in the suttas, which relate to the two main dimensions of mindfulness, which I just mentioned. So if we think of mindfulness as being like remembering the teachings, okay, then Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of the teachings, so that when we leave here this evening, we can recall to ourselves what was being talked about, what Dhammas were spoken of, how are they understood? How are they described? And we can investigate those with our, with our dhamma vichaya, okay? comparing one to the other, analyzing them, and okay? seeing whether they're consistent, seeing how they fit together, and these kinds of things. So this is a kind of an active process. Through this process, we gain a certain kind of wisdom. We gain an understanding of the teachings. We gain an understanding of our own minds. We under, gain an understanding of our own human condition through this reflective process. And this is part of the development of wisdom in Buddhism. But of course, only part, because when that teach, when that, while that practice remains at that level, it's only theoretical, it's only conceptual. And as such, it doesn't go very, very deeply. Okay, so it's, it's important, it's necessary. We shouldn't despise it or criticize it, but we recognize it has its limitations. Now. The other aspect of mindfulness I mentioned is mindfulness of present moment. What's actually appearing, we call like phenomena. Phenomena is like what shows itself. You know, like the Greek root of phenomena is like what, what displays itself to you. Okay? So what's in your mind that actually arises, perceptions, memories, thoughts. You close your eyes now, you can see sort of vague shapes appearing. You can maybe hear voices talking. You can... You can see the, the, the physical, like the after image on the retina, uh, various kinds of things. So these are like the phenomena. This is what's displaying or making itself apparent to you in the present moment. And so Dhamma Vichaya is then the investigation of that Dhamma, investigation of these feelings. Why? You know, why, when I hear that sound, do I get startled? Yeah? So you, you can see those two things. This happens and then there's a reaction. So Dhamma Vichaya investigates that. Why is there that response to it? And you know, you, to be able to see this is conditioned, that the sound is the sound, but our, rea our response to the sound is something that's something quite again. And this is one of the things that they've tested recently with these very well-known uh, 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 psychological tests of meditators, and they did it with <coughs> gunshots. And so... You know, of course, in any time you hear a gunshot, there's going to be a startle reaction. Yeah, you, you, you're going, it's such a loud sound. You can't help yourself from being startled. And everybody has that. Everybody, when they hear a, hear a gunshot, will jump. And they did this test. They did it with like seasoned army personnel, military pe people, who were used to hearing guns every day. Yeah? 
And still, even though the, they had less of a startle reaction, but still, they would have that startle reaction. And then they did it with this one Tibetan monk who did it. And his response was just absolutely off the scale because when they shot the gun, he actually settled down and became more, more peaceful. No startle reaction at all. And in fact, his mind just went... Yeah? And now that is real mindfulness. That is mindfulness that's so sharp that even that totally in instinctive response, remember that, that gunshot, it's, it's, like, it's like hitting one of those primal instincts of like fight or flight. Yeah? It's, it's that instinct of danger and fear that happens. Very, very primal. And the mindfulness is so sharp that it will even... Just dissipate that. You can think about how powerful that is. If, if that ability is made more available in our culture, that any time we have those stimuli of fear, of, of danger, of threat and so on, that people's mindfulness can intervene. And whenever that happens, whenever you get abused, whenever there's an accident, whenever there's a threat, a danger, instead of, you know, the, then the, the arousal, then there's a sense of peace coming from it. Yeah? Imagine what a change that would make. And so the Dhamma which I, the investigation of Dhammas is actually able to, to, it looks at the reaction to that. Why do I get startled? Why is that noise and I react to it in that way? And so it's looking into cause and effect. Dhamma which I am. So the next one of the awakening factors, the awakening factor of energy, virya. Yeah? Virya is the, as an abstract form from the, the, the noun vira, meaning a hero. Okay? So, vir, um, virya literally means heroism. Yeah? So, virya is the quality that doesn't give up. It's the quality of perseverance. The quality that will, whatever happens, that it will take this as a, um, as a challenge. It will take it as something which is calling up more reserves. And we have to be clear about this, we have to be honest about this, that no one will uh, become enlightened or awakened or no one will even really improve themselves without putting forth effort, without trying. And so, you know, there always will come a time, no matter who you are, where you have to push, you have to make yourself get up and do your meditation in the morning. And, you know, so, you know, when you're getting up in the morning, there's that kind of awful moment, you know, when you actually, it's a kind of moment of dread and despair when you're lying in bed and just this, this the, 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 the possibility of contemplating actually emerging into a sitting posture is just the most revolting thing you, you could even begin to imagine, especially when it's a cold morning and your doona is very, very comfortable. And there's that one moment. This is something I learned from my father, actually. My father, he, he told me, because he always gets up early, and he said, you know, there's that one moment, this awful, dreadful moment when you're getting up. But after that, it's okay, isn't it? Yeah? So there's that one moment when you just can't... But it's just like the fear of that kind of one moment of actually moving out of that comfort zone. But actually, of course, it's fine. It's just getting up. You do it every day. It doesn't hurt. And you can sit in meditation. So you need to keep that up as a regular practice. Keep, um, you know, whether you want to or not. And one of my favorite, most memorable sayings from Ajahn Chah was, don't pay any attention to feelings of diligence or laziness. If you feel diligent, forget about it. Just practice anyway. If you feel lazy, just forget about it. Just practice anyway. Ignore those kinds of feelings. Just practice. So this is what we need to do. Don't, sometimes we get too worried about how practice is going. We think, oh, I don't really feel inspired to practice or it hasn't been going that well or blah, blah, blah. And so we, 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 we think about it too much. We, we analyze it. We worry about it. Just throw those thoughts out the window. Just get on with it. Jump on your cushion. Do some sitting. And even if you have to adopt some skillful means, all right? So you say, well, okay, if I sit in meditation, I'm going to allow myself an extra 
slice of cake or whatever it might be. I don't know what it is. But you promise yourself some reward, okay? And you say, okay, just five minutes. Even I'll just do five minutes sitting. Because once you're there for five, you know, you've got to say, well, if you're going to do five minutes, you might as well do ten minutes. I mean, once you're there, right? And after you've done ten minutes, you may be quite peaceful in that, so you can keep going for another twenty minutes, yeah? And uh, so, you know, the, often the effort is to actually just get there in the first place. And then to persist. Don't let, again, when you're sitting, don't just give up when things get difficult. If you're sitting there and you get tired and sleepy, you get restless, just keep going anyway. Just ignore those feelings and keep practicing. You get sleepy, be sleepy. Do sleepy meditation, that's okay. What's wrong with that? If you get very restless, do restless meditation. That's all right. Nothing wrong with restless meditation. If you, fill, if, you get, if, you, if you get filled with anger, you can't stop thinking about that person who did that really awful thing to you. You know, that person, they push in front of me in a line for the coffee at work yesterday. I should have got the coffee before they did, but they got it in before I did. And you're sitting there on and on and on. Just sit there like that. That's okay. Do angry meditation. Yeah? But at least you're working with it. So no meditation is a bad meditation. Because it's, it's at that time when things are going wrong, that's when you're working with them. That's when you're planting the seeds for the flowering of very beautiful mind states because you're actually in there trying. Yeah? So it's like, you know, you think about your garden. If you have a garden in the backyard, it's when it's full of weeds, that's when you go out and do the work. You don't think, well, I'm, it's full of weeds now. Oh, I'll wait until the flowers have grown up and the weeds have all gone and then I'll do some gardening. Yeah? It's when it's full of weeds, that's when you need to get in there. And of course your hands get dirty, of course you get sweaty, of course it's, you, know, you get calluses or whatever. But that's what's laying the, the groundwork for the future. So there's no such thing as bad meditation. The worse the meditation is, the more work you're doing, and the better results you'll have in the future. And you can actually really see that sometimes, because it's something I've noticed is that you know, some meditators are very gifted. Some people maybe done practice in their past lives or whatever, I don't know. But when they come to sit meditation, the mind's very bright. You know, and they come along and see you, and this is like one in a hundred or something like that. Most people come along and see you, they're oh, thinking about this and that, and like oh, restless and blah, blah, blah. Then some people come along and just say, oh, no, I didn't have any of those things. I just sat down and watched my breath, and my mind's really bright, and just sat there for a couple of hours, and it was, it was great. It was meditation business. But they don't appreciate it. You know, after a while, maybe they get, oh, yeah, and then they go and do something else, and they, you always, they always kind of think, well, I can come back to it. It's always there. Well, maybe it isn't. Yeah, it's uncertain as well. And so sometimes they don't appreciate how much work it takes to, to achieve these, these, these mind states. So if you do get that sort of states of peaceful mind and bright mind, then really appreciate it. It's something very, very precious. Don't just disregard this. So this is the energy. Now, if you have that <coughs> energy, then what that does is it makes you happy. When we get lazy, lazy, laziness causes like a dullness in the mind. And when we put forth effort, when we try, then there's this sense of elation. We, we feel happy. And we've, all, we've all felt this, haven't we? If we go out and do some exercise, you know, we go for a walk and, uh, or do some sport or something like that, it actually feels good you know, to actually put forth the effort. It creates a sense of happiness. And this, is, this initial stage of happiness in Buddhism is called rapture, piti. Pali, the Pali word is piti, Sanskrit priti. Uh, we usually translate it as rapture or joy. And when we're talking in a, in a specifically meditative context, we mean a, a, a spiritual kind of happiness which is very uplifting. This is what that rapture is. It's an uplifting form of spiritual joy. And this happens through the meditation. It will arise from inside the meditation whether you're doing metta meditation or breath meditation, there'll come a time when the mind's peaceful and this sense of joy will well up 
You actually feel it. You can feel it physically. It's embodied. You can feel it. And it will have many different kinds of uh, characteristics. So when it happens to us, it might happen in many different ways. Sometimes you can feel goosebumps. Sometimes you feel like the hairs on your arms standing up. Sometimes you feel like this kind of electric shock going through your body. Sometimes maybe you feel like uh, your body's become very light, like you can float up from your seat. Sometimes you might feel like your body's become very big. You know, you're sitting there and it's like you feel like you're blowing up like the Michelin man. Yeah? It's just a, just a perception. Or you feel like you're very heavy, but not, not dull heavy, but like solid, like granite. You can be sitting there and just feel this feeling of just absolute immovability. Or sometimes it might be a lot of movement. Sometimes your body might shake and tremble. You can sit there and, 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 and jerking or spasming. You can even like throw yourself off your meditation seat. Yeah? You have this jolt come through you and you <laughs> throw yourself over the other side of the room, which is a bit embarrassing if you're in a retreat. But uh, it happens. Or a very common one, of course, is tears. Yeah, you're sitting and joy comes up and then just tears flowing down your eyes. In fact, that's, that's probably quite normal, uh, especially when it gets more refined, that the tears will start, the eyes will start to well up with, with um, the bliss of meditation and then just the tears will be coming down. So all of these things can happen in meditation and they happen quite frequently. So the reason we talk about them is partly to get people interested. Oh, that sounds good. Wouldn't mind a bit of that. And also just, just to reassure people, because often you know, we don't know what happens. When, when, when we're meditating, we're like moving out of the realm of everyday experience, out of the realm of what we know, out of the known into the unknown. And when that happens... We don't recognize what's going on. We don't, we, we're not familiar with the landscape anymore. And so sometimes we're unsure, we're uncertain, maybe we're scared, and so on. So if this happens to you, don't, don't, be, don't worry about it. If, if you're concerned or you have doubts, then you need to find a meditation teacher, someone who has some experience, and then just ask them about it. Okay? But nine times out of ten, these things are not a problem. Occasionally there may be some problem, but... Nine times out of ten, it's just the ordinary experiences that you tend to happen in meditation. Now, when these things happen to you, don't get excited by them. If they don't happen to you, don't get depressed. Right? But you just keep meditating anyway. So always remember this, if you're doing breath meditation, you just come back to the breath. And especially if you feel kinds of rapture that are coming up through your body, yeah, like sensations of joy or welling up or whatever, don't pay attention to those things. Just keep watching your breath. The kind of rapture which you want is the rapture that transforms from inside the breath. Yeah? It wells up like water inside the breath. So you're not going from here to somewhere else to see the rapture, but you're, you're looking in that same place and it's like coming up inside that same place. And because that's, where the, that's with unification, that's oneness. It's in the same place. It's not, there's like, like a feeling of breath here and a feeling of rapture somewhere else. It's just that one thing and you're looking within that one thing and there's a perception of oneness in that breath. This is what, we're, this is what we want to see. And the kind of rapture which we want is, they call <coughs> paranapiti, is pervasive rapture. Pervasive rapture, you can, you, you can feel it through your whole body. If you're watching your breath, you feel it through the whole breath. It, it lasts for a long time. It's not like a shock or, or a wave, but it's very even. Yeah? It's an even, steady thing. It'll, you'll feel quite solid. And it will move towards tranquility. And that's the next one of the enlightenment factors, the awakening factors, is tranquility. So these things will tend to move from one to the other. When we sit to meditate, we mindful, we watch the breath, we apply our mind to it. Yeah? We have the Dhamma Vichaya, where in, we're understanding, we're investigating what's actually happening in our mind at the present moment. We have the energy 
to apply ourselves and to persist in the meditation because we have the energy that makes us happy. The joy wells up within us. And when that joy wells up, then the mind goes to tranquility. So notice that whole process. Tranquility doesn't come first. This is something where maybe uh, Buddhism has something to teach modern psychology because often in, in psychology, if, you, if, you're like, you know, if you have various mental problems and things, you know, attention deficit or whatever, and they give you something to tranquilize you. Yeah, but often that just tends to make you kind of down and depressed or whatever. Whereas what Buddhism teaches is, no, you don't go from like restlessness straight to tranquility. You go from restlessness towards applying effort in a constructive way, bringing up the joy and happiness from that. And when the mind is very joyful and happy, then it will become content by itself with a, with a kind of a, a, uh, a wakeful tranquility. Because if we don't have that sense of rapture and the sense of energy, then the tranquility will incline towards sleepiness. So this, of course, is very common in our meditation that when we're sitting down, all the stuff of the day, trains and cars and business and everything, and then we just want to, we want to try and exclude all that stuff. And we, oh, it's peaceful, and it's so peaceful that we fall asleep. Yeah? And it's, it's very natural. Because that's all we've known in our life is just doing stuff or else falling asleep when we stop doing stuff. So we need to find that zone in the middle. We need to change the conditioning of our mind so that we don't associate emptiness or not doing things with falling asleep. We need to change that conditioning so that we associate meditation with that time of supreme wakefulness. And again, this is how we do it. We do it by not being lazy in the meditation, not just sitting down there and flopping out in our mind and just, just, just zoning out. We do it by applying ourselves very carefully and diligently to your meditation object. In the beginning of the meditation, this is the mindfulness, the beginning of the meditation, watch your meditation object very carefully. I will put a lot of effort into that and sustain that effort. Bring that joy up. And then when that joy comes up, then the tranquility will be much deeper. It will be a very profound tranquility, which will affect us at a much deeper level than simply finding another posture to fall asleep in. Yeah? So that tranquility is something that has both a mental and a physical aspect. So we will feel this tranquility through our body. You could measure it if you, if you had, you know, measuring heart rate and breath rate of the breath and all of these kinds of things, you can actually physically feel these things slowing down. You can feel internally in your mind, you can feel the energies throughout the body, the legs, the back and so on, coming to a balance. You can feel this sense of, almost like the sense of pressing stillness where, where you kind of enter into a zone where just movement is is alien. Movement is is it's just it's like, it's like foreign to where where to this space or to this zone where you're at. So you can just sitting there, and so much tranquility. And so whereas that that joy, the, the the rapture stage, you know, even the rapture stage, you know, it's like an emotional reaction. An emotional response. So, you know, you can feel yourself crying, you may be laughing or you may be smiling. You can be sitting there smiling in your meditation, these kinds of things. When that goes further into that stage of tranquility, then you become almost, it's almost you become very serious. Yeah? So your face would look very serious when you're sitting there in meditation, but actually you're still feeling a very deep sense of bliss. But it's much very, it's very, very settled, very, very solid. And it's that stage or that stage of bliss which leads to what we call samadhi. Samadhi coming together of the mind, the coalescence of the mind. Yeah? So this is where that uh, meditation object becomes so bright, so clear that we absorb into it. We absorb into a sense of oneness with that meditation. Leaving behind the world of sight, sound, smell, taste, touches. Leaving behind the world of thinking, ideas, memories and going into that world of just oneness, of being in with that light, that bliss. And then staying with that for 
as long as it wants to stay. Yeah? Just letting that condition last uh, and then withdrawing according to its nature. Now, in, in Buddhism, if you look at, at Buddhist meditation, for example, when we talk about samadhi, then they talk about the four jhanas. And I won't go into these in detail right now, but the, the interesting to notice that the fourth jhana is the one that's primarily associated with equanimity. So after those strong feelings of rapture, bliss and so on have died down, what we're left with is equanimity. Ubeka sati parisudhin, purification of mindfulness and equanimity. It's the fourth jhana. So here the mind is very, very stable. But what's interesting to notice is, is that this equanimity is like an outcome of that, those feelings of happiness, rapture and so on that we've experienced before. That's very important to know and it's a very deep psychology in that. If we try to practice too much equanimity in our meditation, it won't work. Our mind won't be, our mind needs that, that pull, the pull of the happiness that's going to, you know, it's like the glue that sticks us onto our meditation and gives us a sense of stability. We need that pull to actually make us unified. And only when the mind is very pure are we able to actually have that very deep equanimity. So it's something very important to remember and I think it's something which meditators often neglect and that they try to meditate too much with a, with, with a neutral feeling, with an equanimous feeling and that this uh, doesn't allow the mind to settle very deeply. <clears throat> and so equanimity, the word we, I, we translate as equanimity in Pali is Upeka, literally means watching over something. So the literal meaning of Upeka is watching over. So equanimity doesn't mean ignoring things. So right, equanimity isn't like indifference. It doesn't mean we don't care about things. But equanimity means we're watching over something very carefully. And so equanimity happens, or the, the time for equanimity is when things are in balance. When things are out of balance, we bring them into balance. We, we don't have equanimity at that stage. We, we do this or we do that to bring it into balance. Once it's there, then we have equanimity. Oh, okay. Just letting it unfold. And so that especially happens when the mind is very purified. We manage to get rid of the hindrances, get rid of the, the defilements of the mind, all those things that are causing suffering in the mind. When they're very low or cleared out of the mind, we can trust our mind. We know we're not going to get into trouble. We know we're not going to do anything stupid. So we just let the mind go on and just watching. And so it's from that sense of just watching, of equanimity, that the realization of the Dhamma comes from, actual penetration through to the Dhamma. So when all of these factors come together, these awakening factors, when they've all been developed in the right way, to the right degree, in the right balance, then at that time of equanimity will come that insight where you see the Four Noble Truths. You don't, you're not just thinking about them anymore, you're not reflecting about them, but you're actually embodying them. You're undergoing, as the word in Pali uses, is you undergo avecha. <laughs> some, some of us haven't quite got there yet, but eventually all beings will become enlightened according to some Buddhist beliefs. But <clears throat> so this, anyway, this is my talk for this evening on the awakening factors, seven awakening factors or factors of enlightenment. So I offer this to you for your reflection.